Hello, welcome. My name is Jody Skulls. I am your instructor for the MBLEX review class. Today we are talking about ethics, rules, laws, and regulations. Yeah, kind of boring, but necessary if you are going to be successful with the MBLEX. All right, our class goes down in three parts. First part is the test taking strategy. The strategies you'll need to be successful with the MBLEX. Uh, additionally, uh, the second part of class, that will be our learning, the learn, learn, learn. Uh, and then finally, uh, we dissect some questions. All, each of these parts, all of these parts are important uh, to give you the tools that you need to be successful with the MBLEX. Um, and many of you have the knowledge that you need to pass today, but you don't have the strategy. And so that's part of what you learn here. Um, and in part one, I wanna share with you today this test taking strategy of doing meaningful homework. Doing meaningful homework is important because sometimes we feel like we're spinning, right? We've got all these books open. We have uh, you know, our notebooks from school. We have online resources. And really, it's hard to figure out what is considered meaningful homework. Uh, and so my strategy on meaningful homework is to look at the eight categories that the Federation gives us as far as the eight topics that are going to be covered on the MBLEX. Uh, I'll show you the content outline. Uh, and you can see not only the names of the categories, but the percentage of questions that'll be on your MBLEX. Um, for many of the graduates, many of you listening right now, you have already taken the MBLEX. Uh, you've done what I call fail forward. You've failed forward and through. Uh, and you know, the important thing is not that you fell off the horse. The important thing is getting back on the horse, right? Yeah, so here you are, you're back on the horse. If you're listening, then you've dusted yourself off and you've gotten back on the horse, so good job. Meaningful homework, taking the time that you have set aside to study and doing something that produces better results, more learning, more strategy, more understanding, more preparedness for the MBLEX. And so following along uh, an eight week class or a four week class or a four week strategy, an eight week strategy, you can look at one category of the MBLEX, let's say anatomy and physiology, and do that for one week. Say you're, uh, you're studying twice a week, then you'll be studying anatomy twice a week for one week. Then you'll switch gears. Another content uh, uh, section is client assessment, reassessment, and treatment planning. The next week, you do two study sessions on just client assessment, reassessment, and treatment planning. And you can work through each of the eight categories over an eight week period. That's what we do here in class. I cover a different topic each week. All of those topics, uh, all of the recorded videos are on the Patreon site. Uh, the information is in the YouTube uh, description if you haven't found it yet. Hmm. Let's see. So doing meaningful homework, you can follow the outline from the FSMTB. And if you're feeling comfortable, you can also, as a part of doing meaningful homework, do practice exams. Yeah, practice exams. Now, if you're doing the practice exams that you get like on the free app from AT, um, AMTA, uh, you know, you're doing 10 questions here, 10 questions there. That's great. Um, however, it is not going to prepare you for the MBLEX. Nope, sure is not. Just like if you were going to go run for an hour and a half. Could you just go run out the door and go run for an hour and a half? Not me. Um, I can run pretty good for five minutes. I can run pretty good for probably 20 minutes, 30 minutes. But those longer distances, I would need to build my stamina. And likewise, with the test, with the MBLEX, 
we are building our test taking stamina by actually taking longer tests. So we train our brain to endure a little bit longer, up to an hour and 50 minutes. And by doing so, we bring that training into the test center, into our testing cubicle. And we're able to lose focus and refocus. It's not that you won't lose focus. You might, that's okay. It's the ability to refocus, to breathe, to recognize, okay, I'm a little nervous. I'm a little anxious. That's okay. That's no problem. Breathe. Take a moment. In fact, today, I'm feeling a little, you know, scattered, I guess. And so let's just take a moment and breathe. I don't know what you were doing right before you started studying or before you started listening, but it's a hectic morning for me. So feel your feet in your shoes, on the floor, just wiggle your toes. Feel your sit bones, maybe track your attention up your legs, to your hips, to your sit bones on the chair. You are here, you are present. You might be driving, you might be at work, but you have shown up to imprint this information on your brain. We're setting the intention that the words you hear today, the learning that is happening, imprints on your brain. So let's just take a deep breath, take it in through your nose and out through your mouth. Maybe make a little sigh sound. One more time in through the nose and out through the mouth. Close your eyes if you want, if you're not driving. Breathing one last time in through the nose and out through the mouth. Yeah. So as we wrap up our strategy of doing meaningful homework, building test, taking stamina, getting present, returning to the breath, we're going to move into our learning, our learning about ethics, boundaries, laws and regulations, all sorts of fun stuff today. Here we go. Do, do, do. Ethics, boundaries, laws and regulations. Let's get to it. So here's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, and these are straight from the Federation's content outline. So we're going to be defining ethical behavior as it pertains to massage therapy. Professional boundaries. We're going to talk about terms like the therapeutic relationship, dual relationship. We're also going to talk about multidimensional relationships. We might get to sexual misconduct, but I don't think so. Um, we're gonna talk about scope of practice. We're gonna talk about laws and regulations as it relates to massage, um, and then define some terms like principles, um, morals, um, ethics, those types of things. All right, so here are some definitions for you. The definition of integrity, as this is just the straight up definition, and we're going to define these words that kind of sound like each other, but I want you to be clear because when you see these questions on the MBLEX, they can be very tricky. So integrity, it's the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles, moral upright. It's following your inner guidance, right? A man or woman of integrity, you follow your own values. You follow um, a strong moral principle. Whatever you believe on the inside is how you act on the outside. Now, there are three levels of integrity, keeping your agreements, being true to your principles, and being true to yourself. When you're true to yourself, you're acting in integrity.
ethics, another definition. Technically, if someone were to ask you what is the definition of ethics, it's the study of what's right and wrong in human conduct. It's a study. The ethics is the study. It's the principles of conduct. And that can govern yourself as an individual or as the ethics of a group. So many people who become massage therapists consider themselves spiritual, but not necessarily religious. Right and wrong sometimes is associated with religion. I'd like to pull that apart. And we're going to put right and wrong to the side and just call it that's an ethical, it's an ethical word. When you see this definition, right and wrong, you may be talking about ethics, but you might be talking about morals because morals also come with kind of that religious overtone. So let's look at the difference between the two. Morals are a person's standards of behavior. So ethics is the study of right and wrong, whether it's an individual or a group. Morals are yours. A person's standard of beliefs concerning what is acceptable and not acceptable to do. So it is our thoughts on right and wrong, but I would offer you the opportunity, I would ask you to consider, what if there is no right and wrong? What if there's just good, better, good and better? So moral excellence, Aristotle said, moral excellence comes about as a result of a habit. We become just by doing just acts. We become temperate by doing temperate acts. We become brave by doing brave acts. So moral excellence is the result of habits, but morals are a are, are person's standards of what's acceptable and not acceptable. And I would en encourage you to consider that language, um, acceptable, not acceptable. That's good, that's good, but that's better. Versus this kind of judgmental right and wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, if you see right and wrong, typically that's going to be um, to do with ethics. But acceptable, unacceptable, personal standard, that's going to be morals. All right. Here's a, con here's a slide that compares and contrasts. So ethics, there's typically reasoning. Um, this is beyond the rules of what laws say. So laws are actually written rules, right? They're codified. They're everybody. Okay, there's a law about this. This means a group has accepted this particular um, this particular rule. Um, so ethics can be considered universal, um, and you know they say the survival of the society um, is about the ethical ethics of the society. But morals, really, again, is that individual. So we we look inside to see what our morals are. Um, and these are hard and fast, meaning that, you know, if you're stepping out on what you morally believe, you know, you have a feeling. That's why we consider them hard and fast that they're just, they're like, you know, because of the inside, not because of a law, a law that you may or may not agree with. This is from the inside. Okay. Um, and this is really about, I wouldn't add the survival of the individual, sure, um, but also to be in integrity, we have to acknowledge our morals. Integrity comes from being in alignment with our morals. Yes. So when I say, let me ask you before, I guess I've kind of prompt, I've led the witness here. When you think of a cow, do you think of something like this? Or do you think maybe of something like this? Or something like this? We have the opportunity to acknowledge 
that different cultures have different morals. Is either one right or wrong? If you think of a cow like this, that doesn't make you right or wrong. If you think of a cow like this, that doesn't make you right or wrong. Both points of view exist. Both points of view are right. Both points of view are good. For one person, there's a better way. For one person, it's been a choice. It's just based on how we're raised. And I wanted to introduce you to the concept that two very different points of view can exist and both be good. All right, that's because of morals. Values, these also, um, these decisions also are influenced by our values. So these are principles and beliefs that the influence our behavior, morals and values, very similar, right? Um, this can uh, influence an individual, a group, a community. Uh, these are lasting beliefs that typically are shared by the members of a culture about what's good, bad, desirable, undesirable, our value system. And this can sh be shaped, can change over time, um, it can change by zip code. It can change by country. But these are values that we've all agreed on. So maybe you live in a neighborhood where the value system says, okay, well, garbage comes on Thursdays. So we don't put our trash out on Fridays and wait till the following Thursday. That's a value system. You know, if we see a piece of trash on the ground, do you pick it up? Do you walk by it? And these are um, values, just though they influence um, your behavior, your value system. Living with integrity means behaving in ways that are in harmony with our personal values. That's Barbara DeAngelis. Barbara DeAngelis uh, has about 20 best-selling books, um, a lovely author. And I'd encourage you to, um, to uh, find her books at the library. Do you go to the library? Again, um, just different values on, okay, do I buy a book or do I borrow a book? All right, let's look at principles. Uh, principles are the rules or laws of behavior that also allow a person to behave with integrity. Now, again, see how these words kind of mosh together? Morals, principles, values. So these are rules or laws of behavior. These are principles are not um, laws. They're rules of behavior. Uh, and Prince William said, I believe that respect and kindness are two of the most important principles that my parents taught me uh, growing up in regard to how to treat others. Sorry, the picture kind of covers the rest of the quote. All right, moving away from definitions, I wanted to introduce you to what's called the standards of practice. Standards of practice are guidelines for us as licensed massage therapists. And when it comes to the MBLEX, they use standards, a, a, a specific standard of practice. We're gonna, we're gonna see it right now. You might be familiar with it. You might've heard of it at school, um, but we have defined the standard, it's a benchmark, an expected level of care, uh, a standard of your massage practice. Uh, so these are gonna speak to uh, six different areas. Uh, so let's just take a look. But who gave us our standards of practice? Uh, it's an organization called the NCBTMB, the National Certification Board, for therapeutic massage and body work. I believe one of the worst acronyms ever, but the National Certification Board uh, for Therapeutic Massage and Body Work. So have you seen this emblem? Have you ever heard of them? So they're a national association. 
They are focused, the National Certification Board is focused on recognizing massage therapists that have more than the minimum requirements to practice. Have you heard of a board certified surgeon? A board certified physical therapist. This is the massage therapist's board certification. This is our certification board. And so they are here to recognize those therapists that have more than the minimum requirements. They are also here um, to offer our continuing education. We can become board certified and you can explore that at another time. Uh, it does require a certain amount of experience. It does require a fee and it does require another exam. Yes. However, by distinguishing yourself as a board certified therapist, it really looks good on paper. It really looks good if you want to work in healthcare. In the BCTMB, board certified in therapeutic massage and body work, you're a board certified massage therapist. This distinguishes you as having more than the minimum requirements. They also, as I mentioned, determine um, if you want to teach one day, if you want to teach for continuing ed credit as massage therapists in your state, you're going to need to look up how much continuing education you need. Some states it's 12 per year. Other states it's 24 every two years. And it differs state to state. The NCBTMB recommends 24 credits every two years. And they have determined who your official approved providers are. And so when you take continuing education, your teacher, your provider will have a board, a national certification board license number, approved provider number. That's another role of the NCB TMB. They have also established our standards of practice. And the first one we look at is professionalism. I mentioned there are six. We're only going to cover three, three or four today. But well, let's take just a quick peek at the first standard of practice, and that is called professionalism. Now, um, massage therapists, we all come from different states, different backgrounds, different ways of living. However, when we put on our massage therapist hat, we are bringing forth a professional image. You are about to become a licensed healthcare professional. We expect the NCB TMB, your all of your coworkers, all of your colleagues across the your state, across the nation, across the world, are asking all therapists to agree to the standard of professionalism. And this also speaks to the safety of the clients, public safety, right? The safety of our clients. We are going to practice with a certain level of professionalism. Do you, how does that show up for you? So it says here on the slide, demonstrate excellence, promote healing, well-being, um, have responsible, compassionate touch. Thank you. But one of the ways we show professionalism is how we dress. How are you going to dress during your massage sessions? Are blue jeans in or out? My personal opinion, out. You can't move too well in them. Are shorts in or out? 
Well, at my office, I ask that shorts, if someone is going to wear shorts, that they are uh, that they are longer than the ends of their fingertips when their hands are down by their sides. So if you run a little warm and you want to wear shorts, just make sure they're long enough. Wear a capri pant, a man pre. I don't know about all that. <laughs> Some massage therapists wear scrubs. Some wear uh, a t-shirt that, this is actually me right there. Um, this is at the, uh, the um, World Games of uh, a, a, a sporting event that I attended. Uh, this is the Police World Games, I believe. Uh, this person is actually wearing what looks like it would be a three-quarter sleeve, but it's a monogram shirt, right? It's really easy to have embroidered shirts made. You can even order them standard that say massage therapist. Consider how you want to show up for your clients. Personally, I wear all black. When I, when I do massage therapy, I'm not working at a spa. I'm not working um, at a PT clinic. Um, sometimes I'm going to people's homes. I'm all in black. I don't wear a tank top. Again, these are just standards of practice that you get to pick, but for the emblex, understand if you get a question about professionalism, it could be about your appearance. It could be about your business practices. We are being, professionalism is the standard. All right, let's move along. Move along, move along. Our second practice, we're going to look at practice number two, standard number two, and that's your legal and ethical requirements. And I mean, you guys wouldn't be here if you didn't acknowledge there were legal and ethical requirements to practice massage therapy. You need to pass the emblex. You need to get licensed in your state. And you must comply with all of the regulations of the zip code where you practice. And I would love it if you would put your zip code, um, put your zip code in the chat or put your zip code like in your patron profile or put your zip code in your um, business of body work profile. I would love to know where you're practicing. And if you have questions about where you're practicing, whether you need a local, where I practiced was 22180. That was where I started practicing. And I was shocked that I needed not only my national certification, you know, my, my, to pass the MLEX and get licensed by the state, they required um, national certification exam or the MLEX, national certification exam doesn't exist anymore, but state, county. I was in a county called Fairfax County. They required a license. I was in the town of Vienna. They required a license. And this was just to practice massage. Then I had to get a business license. Four, four things. So it is really up to you, or if you want some help with that, I'm happy to help. I see coming in the chat. Yeah, boom, 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 boom. Yes, I'll be happy to share with you um, if there's any extra requirements um, in your jurisdiction, but take a look at our, our the map of the U.S. right now. I this is the most recent update. I'm gonna put this over here. Um, so there are thrill, still three states without state regulations, and that is Kansas, Kansas, Wyoming, and Minnesota. In Minnesota, many counties have local jurisdictions where you have to get a license to practice. Um, in Vermont. They ask that you register, that, that you register that you are going to be practicing massage therapy, but they don't have any regulations. Yeah. Um, so this is the most up-to-date. Hawaii, Texas, and New York all have their own test. So you can pass the MBLEX um, in Texas. You can take the Texas test or you can take the MBLEX. But in Hawaii and New York, even if you've passed the MBLEX, you need to pass their test too. So. Again, kind of a moving target, right? Um, one of the things I'm looking to do later on is to work with the national certification exam and to say if you are, this is not the case right now, full disclosure, but that if you are board certified, that you are qualified to work in any state. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah, it would make it worth it, right? All right. I also like the idea of being board certified. 
But these, please know that, it, oh, and in California, um, they also, they're going crazy in California right now. Uh, they have jurisdiction by jurisdiction, the requirements change. So um, just know your state. All right, we're gonna skip over. Uh, we've talked about professionalism. We've talked about legal and ethical requirements. We're gonna skip confidentiality and business practices because we've actually talked about those um, most recently. We're gonna jump right into roles and boundaries. So roles and boundaries simply say that there are ethical boundaries that when we are a licensed healthcare provider, when we are a licensed massage therapist, even if your state has you titled as a certified massage therapist, there are roles and boundaries that are, are clearly defined for you as far as your scope of practice. And this is to protect the client and you and to keep safe that therapeutic relationship. So if we were talking about boundaries and we were talking about two countries, there would be a clear line, right? There'd be this fence, there might be barbed wire on the fence, it's the boundary. If you're here, you're in the US. If you're there, you're in Canada. These are role, these are boundaries. So they're very specific when it comes to, uh, to countries um, or to physical boundaries, right? Let's get into what you might be tested on on the MBLEX, considering your therapeutic role and therapeutic boundaries. We'll need to understand some definitions. Dual relationships is any relationship outside of the therapeutic one. So there are going to be times where the only relationship you have with your client is the therapeutic relationship. That means they come and see you for massage. Right now, hopefully you're practicing your massage skills. Uh, your massage techniques, and likely you're doing that with family and friends. So that is an example, family and friends who become clients, that's a dual relationship. Now, this is in the early part of your massage therapy career, you're seeing people you already know. But let's say it move along in your massage career and you're starting to see people who were referred to you, who you don't know. So a dual relationship, so let's start with the primary relationship. If your primary relationship with that person is as a client, you did not know them before, they were referred to you by your aunt, by your friend, you know, by, you know, somebody gave them your business card. The only relationship you, you have with them, that primary relationship is the therapeutic one. You have never seen them out anywhere. You don't know them before. The dual relationship happens when you see them outside the therapeutic setting. So that could be social, seeing a client at a restaurant. You're not there with them. You happen to see them. Maybe it's a family connection um, you know, uh, that, uh, as I mentioned, your mom, you know, your dad, your sister, your aunt, they're coming in. You've, you've got a dual relationship because you knew them before because of them being family. Um, you may be uh, in a business setting. You know this person in a business setting. Uh, you buy goods or services from them. That could be considered a dual relationship. So it's anything outside the therapeutic relationship. Let's also mention multidimensional relationships. And that's where you have more than two relationships. So maybe there you buy goods and services. Maybe you, um, and we have an example of this um, later on in just a minute, but the multidimensional, it has many different facets, many different elements. Maybe you know them in many different ways. So uh, using this multidimensional word in a sentence, Good CEOs find the order in chaos, tackling multidimensional problems. That brings clarity to the issues that others may find baffling. 
Um, Multidimensional is also used in science, um, specifically in physics um, and math. Um, so having more than three dimensions. Um, again, multidimensional spaces speaks to equipping physicists to explore the possibility of other dimensions, but multidimensional, more than two. Okay, so three or more. Here are a couple examples which could lead to a dual relationship or a multidimensional relationship. You're doing a race and you see a client at the race. You're in the grocery store. You see, you're at the bakery. You see a client shopping also for baguettes. You're at the gym. You see a client at the gym. Now, for the emblex, because I wanna to speak to confidentiality here for just a moment. Part of this dual relationship scenario, you will need to have confidentiality. Do not, you are not, it is not best practices. And if you get tested on this, you have to almost ignore your client. So if you see your client who out in the real world, basically you're to ignore them. If your eyes make contact, obviously you've seen them. So you, you, I don't know if they've seen you, but a smile and a nod. On the emblex though, you are not to engage with them. That is the, the best answer if you get this as an emblex question. You do not engage with them. The reason being not everybody shares with their family, their friends, their significant other that they get massage. So if you all bouncy, happy, hey, how are you? How you feeling? How's that back? The people around them be like, oh, how do you guys know each other? Oh, I'm, I'm the massage therapist. Oh. You see how that can go south? How that can go wrong? Right. So you can smile and nod. If they engage you, that's up to them. But we do not engage them. That is because of the dual. We've, we've just had a dual relationship pop up. Okay, that's the one where we only have a therapeutic relation and all of a sudden, oops, we've seen them outside of the therapy room. The other flip side of that though is if you knew them before, you already have a dual relationship. So we just have to keep the therapeutic relationship intact. We have to respect that therapeutic. And this is difficult, you guys. Like say you're massaging your mom. I massage my mom. When it's time for her appointment, I have my therapy hat on. I have my therapist hat on. That appointment starts and ends on time. I ask her if she has anything she wants specific work on. We set a specific time for the session for her, usually 90 minutes. And she is a client. She is not my mom. Now, if she wants to talk about family stuff, I try and put that in a box and not really talk about family stuff while she's on the table. It's her time to relax, right? You get the idea. All right. If you want to learn more about that, there's all sorts of therapy, psychotherapy, psychology articles. Um, some of my material today has been taken um, from this article on respecting boundaries, the do's and don'ts of a dual relationship. Just want to acknowledge um, Claudia from uh, Social Work Today. Also, respecting boundaries. Um, you don't have to go far to find all sorts of things on the internet about massage therapists who did not respect boundaries. Just Google massage pressing charges. And you can see all sorts of things show up. Reporting about massage therapists who have inappropriate behavior, unacceptable behavior. All right, let's look at the difference too. Before we move into dissecting questions, let's look at the difference between boundary crossings and boundary violations. Um, and so boundary crossing is 
it's an activity where there's a boundary. It, it, for example, you see your client at a restaurant, you see your client at the bakery. That's a boundary crossing because you've only seen them ever before you know, in your office or where you do massage or at their home. You've only ever been in a therapeutic setting with them. That could be a boundary crossing. Sometimes a boundary crossing is at the invitation of your client and in theory could be supportive. So if your client uh, invites you to support a charity and you see them at a race, if your client recommends the restaurant and you see them there, yes, it's a boundary crossing, um, but it's harmless. It's not exploitive. It's not hurting the client. Boundary violation, it's harmful. It's either definitely harmful or potentially harmful to your client and to you and to the therapeutic relationship. Um, and a boundary violation is technically exploitation of the client. We need to, rec and look, you'll need to know this for the MLEX. If you get any questions on boundary crossings or boundary violations, the therapeutic relationship is the priority. Yes, you've had a prior relationship with your mom, with your aunt, but because you have agreed to do the massage, you now have a new role that you have agreed that you will not violate the boundaries. And what I'm thinking of here is this is the teacher student relationship. And in the teacher student relationship, we recognize the power differential. You may have heard that term. I don't have it in my slideshow today, but that power differential, right? The teacher and the student. And so who has the advantage? The teacher, right? Yeah. Likewise, because massage therapy is personal, there's a power differential. Doctors and their patients, right? The doctor wears the white lab coat. It, there's, there's a whole ritual around the exam. The doctor's supposed to be all knowing and the patient is, oh, you know, what's wrong with me? There's an implied power differential that carries through to your massage treatment room. There's a power differential and we need to respect that in keeping the therapeutic nature of the massage by honoring that role, by bringing your professionalism, by not, not violating boundaries. Okay, we're taking a quick break here. What you're about to hear is one of our graduates who arrived to class late and I let her into class. And what we, what I didn't realize is that she was saying, I passed, I passed, Miss Jody, I passed. And so you'll hear a quick little dialogue, um, but wanted to share with you what was happening because I didn't know what was happening in the, in the moment. Um, and it's very exciting. We got to talk with Kemi after uh, class, celebrate uh, with her, and we'll be doing an announcement for her uh, later this weekend. So, but just wanted to frame in that what was happening next in class. So stay tuned. <laughs> Collectivity with a class. Miss Jody, I pass. I pass. I'm sorry. To, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I pass. I'm so sorry. Oh. Talking like that. I passed. <laughs> okay, thank you. Welcome, welcome. Uh, all right, so boundary crossing versus boundary violation. So uh, the crossing, not harmful, not exploiting the client, violation, potentially harmful. And we'll look at a few examples of that. Let's, let's take a peek at that. Oh, other considerations that are gonna help you to keep your boundaries clear. Um, don't practice under the influence of alcohol or any um, drugs or illegal substances. If you need to take um, medication, take your medication. Um, but don't be drinking and then do a massage. Don't say, you know, and look, I know. Look, I got lots of graduates who come to me from Colorado and they enjoy their weed in Colorado. I love it. 
go for it. Do your thing. Just don't bring it into the treatment room. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I know sometimes you like, you want to get in your Zen, right? It can cloud your ability to understand if you are violating a boundary or if your client is violating a boundary. Massage therapists also have the right to refuse or terminate the service of a client who's A, abusive or under the influence of drugs or alcohol or any, you know, or, or any substance. If they are not straight, you can either refuse, decline, it's a better word maybe, decline to do the treatment or to end the session. Again, we need to keep our boundaries clear. This is one way we do so. So here's a few examples, boundary crossing or boundary violation. You see some, you see a, a, a client at church. Let's see, you can put it in the chat if you want. Boundary cross. Yes, Ansley, I hear you. That would be a boundary crossing, right? Oh my gosh, you go to this church too? But again, we don't engage, right? We're not reaching out. That client may say, oh, you go to this church? In that point, you can engage. And we have to let the client lead because we don't know if they share with their spouse, if they share with their family that they get massage. Yes, so boundary crossing or violation, this is a boundary crossing. Uh, going to dinner uh, with your client. Looks like this couple is enjoying a nice glass of wine. Boundary crossing, boundary violation. Boundary violation. Yes, thank you. Boundary violation. Yes. Violation. Wine. But just that has the, the possibility, the potential to be harmful to the therapeutic relationship. Hmm. Texting your client. Sending a text message. I text message my clients. I text message a, a reminder of their session the night before. In this case, boundary crossing or violation? Look at the message that's, that's boundary being sent. Violation. Thank you, Ansley. Yes, it's a violation because it's, oh, I've been thinking of you every second since you left. Hello. That is not a therapeutic relationship. Are you receiving this message or are you sending it? Doesn't matter. It's a boundary violation. This is definitely harmful to the therapeutic relationship. Obviously, don't have sex with your clients. NCB, TNB, AMTA. There's all sorts of writings about this on avoiding sexualizing the therapeutic relationship. They recommend six months. So if you get that question on the Amblex, it's six months that you need to wait before dating someone you met as a client. I'm not saying therapists actually do that. They definitely stop seeing the person as a client. If you are going to have a personal relationship with someone, a romantic relationship with someone, highly recommended not to see them as a client. When it's new, you know what I mean? If they're your husband or your wife, then, you know, again, respecting the therapeutic relationship, like the example I gave you with my mom. There's an appointment. It starts and ends at a, at a specific time. There is no sex on the massage table. This is common sense, right? There's no hand jobs on the massage table. They're not touching you, you're not touching them. All right. I'll, I'll just sidebar here for a moment. I've been um, for many years, uh, a expert witness uh, for uh, for trials with massage therapists who've been accused of inappropriate behavior. And so sometimes I'm very direct um, about uh, what is considered sexual misconduct. Um, and I like to be very clear with you that these are the rules. These are the rules you agree to when you become a licensed massage therapist. All right, let's switch gears as we move into, um, uh, we're close to dissecting questions, transference. So transference is when the client is transferring emotion 
onto the therapist. So the feelings are transferred from the client to the massage therapist for whatever reason. Maybe you used a phrase. Maybe you look like somebody they know. Maybe you um, have an accent. You know, you know, um, maybe you're male. Maybe you're female. Maybe you're, you know, um, you, you've just triggered a memory for them, a, a memory with emotion. And that emotion transfers from them to you. That's called transference. The opposite direction is called counter transference. When the when the, the client triggers you, so the massage therapist's unresolved feelings, unresolved issues are transferred to the client. It can be that they look like somebody. It can be that they said something. It can be that they uh, canceled their appointment at the last minute. This guy's pissed off because they canceled their appointment. Well, you know what? Is this the tenth time they canceled their appointment, or are you just having a bad day and counter transferring your emotion to this client? Client calls, so sorry, stuck in traffic, have to cancel. Holy mackerel! I can't believe it. You're like the tenth thing that's gone wrong today. Yo, slow your roll. That's considered counter transference. So you've got some unresolved feelings, some issues that are being transferred, you're overreacting, transferring, counter-transferring emotions, feelings, words onto that client, not professional. All right, scope of practice. Uh, we need to understand the limitations of our practice. We are licensed massage therapists. We are not personal trainers. We are not nutritionists. We are not counselors, although you may feel like it sometimes. Uh, you're not a psychologist, a psychiatrist. You do not diagnose. You do not prescribe. You do not diagnose conditions. You do not diagnose what strength training your client needs to do. Oh, strengthen your abs. Technically, that's out of the scope of practice. Now, if you have a personal training certificate, by all means, share with them your point of view. But as a massage therapist, we need to understand our scope of practice and operate within it. And if you're asked about it on the, on the MBLEX, we stay in our lane. We do not diagnose. We do not prescribe. We don't do any, um, we don't suggest exercises. We don't suggest nutrition. We can offer water, but, uh, you know, we can't say, oh, technically we can't say, oh, you need water after a massage. It's kind of, in a, it's murky. But always, uh, with the MBLEX, err on the side of caution. On the MBLEX, typically you're going to want to choose the most conservative answer. Okay. Ooh, last one, role-playing. Role-playing is just like what you think of in the theater. Uh, so when they're playing a role. Uh, and so it's when a client or practitioner act out um, something to get more comfortable with it. So if there's a tough conversation that needs to happen, you may incorporate role playing um, prior to having the tough conversation. So maybe uh, we need to fire a client. We need to address a late cancellation. We need to remind a client they no showed, no called. Those can be tough conversations and you may want to consider role playing. If you see role playing on the MBLEX, this is just basically acting out a specific situation to become more comfortable with it. It's also considered a best business practice. If you are uncomfortable having a conversation, you may benefit from role playing it. All right. If you got to drop off, I totally understand. We're running a little behind. I covered a lot of material with you today, um, but we do have a few questions to dissect. So, ready? Going to happy hour with a client would be considered A, a boundary crossing. B, only okay if you knew them before. C, a boundary violation. D, transference. Oh, we got answers popping up in the chat. Ah, okay. <laughs> I think I've driven this point home, right? Look, this is the most conservative, okay? Yes, you guys are getting it. So often I'll ask you to, yes, uh, 
Yes, yes, yes. Very good. Uh, yes, Letitia. Yes. Good. And the yes. Pumla, and I think Milka too. Yes, yes, good. All right, we're going to eliminate one wrong answer. It's not transference. We just learned that, right? And the best answer in this case, C, boundary violation. Going to happy hour with a client would be considered a boundary violation. Now, is it okay if you knew them before? Eh, maybe. That's the asterisk, okay? It's not a boundary violation. It's not officially a boundary violation if you knew them before. Again, when it comes to the emblex, it's a boundary violation. Ooh, long question. A female client says you remind them of their dearly departed aunt. The aunt was a mother figure to her. And you can tell the client's getting a bit emotional talking about the aunt. She mentions that they always went to the theater together. She asks if you go to the theater. This is an example of... A, a boundary crossing. B, a boundary violation. C, countertransference. D, transference. Ooh, I see answers popping up. Ooh, you guys are getting it. Yeah, yeah, Hensley Milka, Letitia, Pumla, you're getting it, you're getting it. Right, all right, so we know, we know that it's not a boundary violation, right, because nothing's happened here. But best answer? You got it. Transference. She's transferring these wonderful, yummy feelings that she had for her aunt onto you. Just need to be careful. Boundaries. No going to the theater with your client. All right. Oh, boy. Your former teacher now works at Starbucks. You see him several mornings a week. Then one evening, you see him at your gym. You both laugh and make a joke. He asks what you do for a living. When you find out your own licensed massage therapist, he said you should make an appointment and come in for a massage. He asks for your business card. What happens next? Okay, this is an example of a long question. You can take a minute to reread it, read through all the answers. All right, A, you give him a business card, but you plan to charge him extra because he gave you a C plus in his class. B, you give him a business card, but plan to ignore his calls because this is a boundary violation. C, you give him a card and Bill would be happy to see him. This is an example of a multi-dimensional relationship. D, I cannot see D. Oh, you give him a business card. Hmm, let me see if I can. Okay. You don't, you tell him you can't give him a massage because it would create a dual relationship, which is unethical. Oh, I see some different answers coming in here. All right. So let's let's get rid of one wrong answer. All right. So you you, you give them a business card and plan to charge them extra. No, that is not correct. <laughs> because that wouldn't be professional. That would be unethical. All right. Um, so of the three remaining answers, we're going to give him a business card and ignore his call. Give him a card. Happy to see him. Tell him you can't give him a massage because it would get it would create a dual relationship, which is unethical. Best answer? C. Whoa, what? Wait, Jody, you just told me. Okay, you give him a card and you'll be happy to see him. This is an example of a multidimensional relationship. Now, this is this um, example also. Um, Assumes you're comfortable with the teacher. You're comfortable doing a massage for him. Um, if you're uncomfortable, then you can give him a card. But then if he calls, just decline to see him. Say, you know, I'm actually not comfortable. You know, after thinking about this, I'm not comfortable doing the work for you. Dual relationships are not unethical. And that's why letter D is not the best answer. Yeah. So, yeah, I know. So they were a former teacher, right? Exactly. But also here in this question, this would create a dual relationship, which is unethical. Not all dual relationships are unethical. 
I mean, I can see my mom for a massage. You can see your teacher for a massage, but you've got to absolutely respect the boundaries. Right? So keeping the therapeutic relationship therapeutic. This would be considered in the best case scenario, given that you're comfortable, you enjoy this person's company, there are no resentments, there's no counter transference coming up, um, that it could be a very healthy therapeutic relationship. Ooh, the best definition of morals is a keeping one's agreements and following the law. B a person's standard of behavior or beliefs concerning what is acceptable and not acceptable for them to do. C, being true to one's principles, sharing the principles with others to make sure everyone is in agreement. D, being true to yourself, being true to oneself, not worrying about what anyone else believes. We're looking for the best answer here. I'm liking it. I'm liking it. Leticia and Ensley are on point. Oh, got more coming in. Oh, yes. Look up, Puma. Kemi, where's your answers? All right, let's see. Let's get rid of one wrong answer. And these, this is tough. Let me get rid of one wrong answer, and I'll tell you why it's tough. Because all these words mix together. And there are a number of you who have English as a second language. That's okay. We're going to do the best we can with these answers. There are going to be some that are just going to be tough because they're so similar. But being true to your principles, sharing the principles with others is not the correct answer. The correct answer is, the best answer is letter B. A person's standards of behavior or beliefs concerning what is acceptable and not acceptable for them to do. Yes, D is wrong, right? D is wrong. Exactly, that is not a definition of morals. Also, it's just, it just doesn't, it doesn't match, right? All right. I believe that might've been our last question. Let's see. Oh, last question. What does the NCB TMB stand for? Careful, careful. This is an example of a tricky question. So the NASH, what does the NCB TMB stand for? A, National Certification Board of Therapy, Massage, and Body Work. The National Certification Exam for Therapeutic Massage and Body Work. The National Certification Body for Massage Therapy and Body Work. National Certification Board for Therapeutic Massage and Body Work. Let's eliminate one wrong answer because they're, they're all basically say the same thing, right? So let's get our heads straight. Let's eliminate one wrong answer. Ooh, we got some answers coming in. Uh-huh, careful, careful. Mm -hmm. Yes, let's eliminate one wrong answer and letter B could have been tricky, right? Because national certification exam for therapeutic massage and body work was a thing. But look, the letters don't match. All right. Best answer? Letter D. NCB TMB stands for the National Certification Board for Therapeutic Massage and Body Work. Yay! Good job. Oh, and thanks for hanging in there. This is some tough stuff. This is some tough topics that we cover today. Um, and yet, uh, it is so bravo, bravo. Um, it is tough topics. Uh, and yet it's stuff we absolutely need to be familiar with to be successful on the MBLEX. So I'm going to hang out for a few minutes with the, with the folks in class. Let me let you see how many people we have. We have bunches of people here today. Um, so again, my name is Jody Scholes. I am your instructor for the MBLEX review course. Um, I wish you the best of luck as you continue to prepare to calmly and confidently pass the MBLEX. I'll see you again real soon. <laughs>